All right. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music's new free monthly web series called Conversations with Our Curator. I am the curator right now. My name is Melissa Ziobro. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're not very familiar with the Bruce Springsteen Archives and Center for American Music here at Monmouth University in beautiful West Long Branch, New Jersey. We preserve the legacy of Bruce Springsteen and celebrate the history of American music and its diversity of artists and genres with our archival collections, exhibits, and programming. We are currently in the midst of planning for a brand new 30,000 square foot museum facility, which is scheduled to open in the spring of 2026. So you can see more about our work, our events, maybe even consider donating at springsteenarchives.org. But a little more about tonight's program specifically, as I said, this free monthly web series will feature researchers and writers exploring new perspectives in American music history. After an initial conversation with me, audience Q&A will follow. I expect that these will usually run about an hour or so, but we can certainly be flexible. And you can hop off anytime you need to, of course. That's the beauty of these virtual programs. <laughs> so tonight, which is only our second of these events, we are joined by Lorraine Mangione and Donna Luff. We will be discussing their 2023 book, Mary Climbs In, The Journeys of Bruce Springsteen's Women Fans. So thank you so much, Lorraine and Donna, for joining us. So happy to have you. Delighted to be here. Yeah, we're thrilled to be here. Awesome. So before we dive into the new book, I always think it is so fascinating to hear a little bit about the author's backgrounds. So Lorraine, tell us about growing up in Connecticut. Okay, so um, hello, everybody. Welcome. So glad to see you all. Uh, my family was from New York City, so we always had roots there, but we loved our small town of Southington, Connecticut, and that's where I grew up, right in the center of the state. Uh, those were the years of the baby boom, so there was a lot going on post-World War II, um, and lots of different music from, in my house anyway, from opera to big band to popular and I just want to say fandom was alive and well in my house. Uh, my dad loved the Italian crooners, especially, of course, Frank Sinatra. I kind of think of Bruce as an Italian crooner tradition. Um, and my mom was in love with Harry Belafonte. We were always dancing to him uh, in the living room. And there were some excellent women singers in there, too. And I always think of like people like Ella Fitzgerald or Rosemary Clooney. But but I, for some reason, there was a bit more passion about the men. Um, my sister and her friend Kathy screaming to the Beatles. My brother with the Moody Blues and Chicago and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And quite honestly, Springsteen started coming up to Connecticut early. But I never saw him in those small, intimate settings. And I don't ever like to be reminded about that. Um, but a very... Um, you know, I was always very academically focused. Uh, uh, I never thought of myself as a nerd, but academics um, and social life were both very important to me. Uh, and it was it was a wonderful way and place to grow up with family and friends. Um, Great, and Donna, you grew up in England, right? Tell us about your early life. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I grew up and um, spent most of my adult life in um, England. I grew, moved here in 2006 to the States. Um, and so I grew up about six miles outside of Birmingham, which is the second city um, in Britain, second largest city. Um, and actually, Lorraine and I listened to some similar music when we were growing up. I was lulled to sleep. My parents loved music and um, we would have um, go to sleep listening to them playing Sinatra, a lot of the Beatles, um, also Ella Fitzgerald. Um, and other, other lots of music actually. So I grew up surrounded by that. We also had a um, close um, family friend who was actually a singer and entertainer in the UK. So we would spend summer holidays 
kind of following the tour around and seeing shows. Um, so um, it became you know, a big part of my life early. And as a teenager, um, I would go and see with my best friend who actually is on here tonight. I'm very excited from my childhood. Um, would go and see like all the bands that came through Birmingham. We went to see a lot of music. Um, and uh, I, we were at that time, there was a lot of great music actually in bands from the Midlands from where I grew up. Um, you know, a lot of ska and new wave music, bands like The Specials, and UB40 and The English Beat, um, Duran Duran. Um, and, you know, Birmingham was always a stop on the tour for them. So we would go and see lots of things. Now, I want to hear how you both became Springsteen fans. Lorraine, it wasn't necessarily love at first listen for you, right? I mean, you just said that you didn't necessarily see him in the earliest shows in your area. Tell us about how you become a fan. Well, I have to say, and I think she's here, one of my best friends, Martha, um, anytime I talk about this, I do another apology to Martha. Um, she's had many since then because Martha climbed in early and she uh, just loved him. And my brother Joe and our friend Barbie and I would make fun of him. Um, Bruce isn't going to hear this, right? Um, we'd say, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he's Bruce, listening right now. I don't know. <laughs> we'd say Bruce Stringbean, Bruce Spring Street. What is, who is he? Um, we really got into fooling around about him and, and he just wasn't like our style or something. And we have regretted that ever since. Um, and it was kind of around, um, my first concert was 1978. Uh, I was out in Kansas in graduate school and that really was the moment of truly climbing in the darkness tour. Um, so we, we, you know, we all make mistakes in our life. What can I say? Uh, and Donna, what do you remember about your introduction to Bruce? I believe I read it was during the River era. Is that right? That's right. I remember distinctly. It was 1981. And I was actually in the backseat of my father's car. He was driving me to school. Um, and Hungry Heart came on the radio. And to this day, I don't know quite why it struck me as big as it did. But I was like, please, can you turn that up? And my sister was talking. I was like, shush. Um, and then I went to our... Um, favorite record store in Birmingham um, the, the following week and bought the single and played it obsessively. And then um, went the following week and bought the River album. So this is um, the River, obviously. And um, at that time, in that, that day that I went to buy the album, there was a sign saying tickets for Bruce Springsteen at E Street Band at our local arena for five pounds, which is was seven, $7, I think in those days. Um, and so I just bought two tickets just like that, which of course has never happened again. Um, and uh, I persuaded my best friend who I went to all those concerts with um, that she needed to come with me because I wanted, you know, we did everything together. So I wanted to indoctrinate her into my new obsession. Um, and uh, when we got to the show on the night of, you know, on the day of, um, a stranger came up to us and offered us a hundred pounds each for each of our tickets, which was an absolute fortune in those days to us as you know teenagers um and she really wanted to sell them and I pleaded with her and persuaded her not to and she said this better be the best show I've ever been to in my life um and of course it was so uh and she now lives in Canada um and uh we still go to shows together oh I love it so listen maybe it wasn't love at first listen but you both become Springsteen fans pretty early in your lives but you're fans you don't build your careers around Bruce so I'd love for you to just tell the audience a little bit about your professional careers because they are they're incredibly impressive careers so if you would just give us a thumbnail sketch of your professional backgrounds outside of Bruce so Lorraine so I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm on the faculty at Antioch University, New England in Keene, New Hampshire. I see a few people from there on here. Um, so one of my favorite teachers at Duke, where I was an undergraduate, put together art and psychology. His name was Erwin Kremen. He was a psychologist and an incredible artist. Um, the dissertation that I did for my degree um, in clinical psych from University of Kansas uh, with Frank Schantz as my advisor was 
actually on the creative process and what it means. So I've always had that interest in creativity and art and my clinical work, my research, my teaching, a lot of it has been around women's issues, which we see again here, um, group therapy, clinical supervision, Italian American families, and we know Bruce fits in with that. Um, loss and grief, adult development, spirituality and religion, and all these intersect with psychology uh, and really relationship is fundamental in any work that I do. And all of this um, comes out in the Springsteen work too. It, it just fits um, with all the stuff I've been doing for years. And you, Donna? Yeah, so I currently work at Boston Children's Hospital and I direct um, a program of simulation training there um, where we do practice, you know, the, the physicians and staff come in and practice doing um, rare events or emergency events. Um, and I also do a lot of teaching at the Harvard Medical School. Um, and I was actually, um, this is a very convoluted path that's led me here. It's not a straightforward one. Um, I was actually an undergrad in American studies. That was my first degree. Um, and then I went on to do um, a doctorate in sociology. Um, and my, my work there was around um, the perspectives of women in um, feminist and anti-feminist movements. So I was really interested obviously in women's perspectives from very early on. Um, I actually got involved in healthcare because of the HIV AIDS um, epidemic. I got very involved in that as an educator and activist. And um, that led me to do a degree in health education, um, which kind of, you know, ended up bringing me into, into healthcare as my career. Um, the one constant has really been being a qualitative researcher. So I, I did qualitative research and I now teach qualitative research at the medical school. So that's the kind of the one constant throughout my career. Hmm. So how did the two of you meet? <laughs> well, do you want me to take that one, Lorraine? Or do you want to? Sure. Um, so we we were both we we're both editorial advisory board members for something called the biannual online uh, journal of Springsteen studies or BOSS. Um, and we were invited to um, participate in that through participation in some of the um, Springsteen symposia that used to be held at Monmouth University. Um, and uh, they were looking for people to review the, the movie Springsteen and I, um, which came out, I can't remember when, 2011. Um, and Lorraine and I both apparently volunteered, but said we've never reviewed a movie before, so we'd like to do it with somebody else. Um, and so we first met at my house when she came to watch the movie with me. So how did the wheel start spinning and put you on the path towards this great interdisciplinary book? Lorraine, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, um, a couple of different things. Uh, so for me, it it had a lot to do with the um, symposia at Monmouth. Um, and I think I went to four of them and I could almost tell you each year. Um, and a lot of people laugh when I tell them there were these symposia on Bruce Springsteen yeah. at a major university, but, but there were. And um, so I think that had a lot to do with it. Um, the, uh, I mean, those were just fantastic events. And even before this research project that Donna and I did, I had a couple of academic papers that I wrote about Springsteen and were public papers that were published, two in psychology journals, um, one in one of the books that came out from one of the uh, symposia. And I think I, again, I think I hear the, the theme of women in both of our work. And in my mind, women and the working class have both been so marginalized in general in our society and women fans have been marginalized um, or stereotyped. And so I think that was part of my thing about doing something with women and women in general are so important in Springsteen's work. The, um, we were asked by a journalist from the Asbury Park Press uh, Chris Jordan last sometime several months ago to write something for him about the five most iconic women in Springsteen. And then he wrote an article based on that. And I have to say of all the things that Donna and I have done, 
that was the most intense and emotional <laughs> because how on earth do you pick the five most iconic women in Springsteen? Um, but that even, that really reminded me of how important women are in his work. So the women theme has been very strong for me. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled with who we, we picked, but I always say to people before you read the article, think of who your own five iconic women are because they don't have to be the same as ours. And, and the last thing I would say is that so much of what we've done, even in the symposia, and then what we've done in this research project just intersects with psychology. It's about so many of the things, meaning in life, who am I? How do you get through hard times? It's, it's, it's psychology, so it just, fits, it just fits really well. You know, life from the highs to the lows. So all of that, you know, women, psychology, that all kind of filtered in together for me and, and laid the groundwork for this work. So are you going to tell us who you named as the five most iconic women, or do you want everybody to go look <laughs> back at the lot for themselves? <laughs> well, we could, we could say. Everybody has to write down their own before we say <laughs> it. Everybody has to say their own. <laughs> We'll, we'll leave that dangling then and everybody will have to think of their own first so you're not putting ideas in their head and then they can cross reference. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to just go back to something you said. You noted women in general are so important in Springsteen's work. Now, I am sure we have many on the call who are very well versed in the Canada Bruce Springsteen, but some <laughs> are less so. So can you just elaborate? What do you mean when you say women in general are so important in Springsteen's work? Um, I would, uh, let me just start. I would just say the fact that it's so hard to think of five iconic women says something right there because women are there both um, in a lot of different ways. And in fact, not to get into all this right now, but, but those were some of the questions we asked on our survey when we did it is Springsteen and women. Um, so there are just some very powerful characters who just seem to run the whole world and there are just um, characters who seem to have just been squashed by the world. Um, you know, I talk with my hands, so this is, you have to like see my hand motions as I say this. Um, and I think they're all there. Um, and in fact, just earlier today, I was trying to explain to somebody at my house who Madame Marie is, because I have a little nice little sign of Madame Marie and the, why did the cops try to bust Madame Marie? So, so many of these women, they're just there all through it. And um, not that women aren't in other artists' work, but not to me, not to the extent that they are in Springsteen's work in a lot of different roles. And that's why choosing the iconic was, was so difficult. I don't know, Donna, what are you thinking? Yeah, no, I was just gonna, yeah, I was thinking about, again, we're getting into some things in the book, but I mean, I think that some of the women that responded to our, uh, survey and talked in the book talked about the char women characters having real lives and having these kind of strong and meaty roles I've got a couple of quotes from the women who talked about them in that way and so I think that the sense that the women characters are central like Lorraine was saying um, but also are kind of fleshed out in a, in a way that certainly women fans were saying they didn't hear so frequently in a lot of particularly male you know rock writing. Mm. Now, Donna, you just referenced the survey. Mm. For anyone who has not read the book yet, can one or both of you tell us a bit more about your source material and your methodology? I'm especially intrigued by the survey. Um, sure. Before we get into that, there's one, one more thing I want to mention. Um, sure. Because this was a big um, impetus for us and um, is Danny Kavici's, Kavici's work. He had written the book Tramps Like Us earlier, and those are based on some interviews with fans. And even he said in that book that women fans had not been, we had not looked into women fans as much as needed to be. That was something that still needed to be done more. Not that he didn't have some women in there. And so again, kind of with the symposium, with Kavici's book, and then with us trying to decide what we were going to do, that kind of all led us to the survey. And I'll let Donna comment on that. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's right. And that's, you know, I was going to definitely mention um, 
Daniel's work because it's was central. And um, I think we kind of decided we would take down, you know, take on that challenge that he'd identified to say something more about women fans. Like from those first conversations that we had, we were like both talking about how we would like to write something about women fans. And so we came around to this idea that we, you know, we're both qualitative researchers. We wanted to hear women's own voices, but we wanted to get a large, you know, quite a large number of women. So we figured we'll ask a survey. We'll ask lots of open-ended questions about things that we were interested in, like, um, you know, how did you become a fan? Why do you stay a fan? How do, what do you think of Springsteen's writing on women? Um, those kind of questions. Um, and then we thought, well, we'll write something. We'll write, you know, for a, a chapter or we'll write a, a symposium piece. And so we sent it out through um, Backstreets. We filled the survey through backstreets.com, which of course sadly is no longer with us. Um, and we expected to get maybe 50 to 100 responses. Um, and we shut the survey down after less than a week when we got like a, a nearly 1200 responses. Um, and um, people had written like, in answer to our open-ended questions, they'd written essays about what they were going to say. So we had all this incredible data. We actually had, we only used complete surveys because we were looking at, you know, demographics and things like that. And we had over 900 of those and we had respondents from 44, US states and DC. We also had people from 24 um, countries across the world. Um, and actually a third of our respondents were from other countries, um, which really speaks to that you know, international fan base and how powerful and passionate that is. Um, and uh, you know, so then we had all this data to, to uh, analyze, which we did. We, you know, we looked through everything. Lorraine and I both looked through it and came up with themes that we saw. And then we had lots of discussion and back and forth, going back and forth with the data. Um, to come up with the kind of what we thought were the central themes. And um, and we started to write about it. And um, we wrote a, a chapter for um, William Wolfe's collection, um, Bruce Springsteen and Popular Music. Uh, and we did do a, a symposium presentation. Um, but uh, I don't think we ever thought we would end up with a book, but then we did. And um, Lorraine, I don't think you want to say something about the second survey, because once we got the book contract, we, we did something else. Um, I will. The, uh, the pandemic, things were so different. And um, as some of you may know or may not know, Bruce really did a lot of um, uh, reaching out to people as a DJ, et cetera. And um, he came out with a couple of new albums, um, especially Letter to You at that time. And so we decided that we wanted to do a survey and that was, um, 600 in all, and maybe 400 that we used. <coughs> um, so we have a second survey too. And we're, re we're really glad we did that. That one was a little bit different because we were more specific. Um, we wanted to, it was like updating us. Um, and, but the surveys in general were just, um, were just pretty amazing. Um, the thoughtful responses, we could not have done this, as Donna said, without backstreets.com. We miss them tremendously uh, for, for you know closing down. And I want to quote my daughter uh, around this because my daughter, who was raised right, and so she's a Springsteen fan um, and has seen him more on this tour than I have, but we don't need to go into that right now. Um, she and I talk about all this stuff a lot. And I asked her if she could write down what she thought was so important about this survey um, when we were, we were thinking about this. And so if you don't mind me reading a couple of sentences um, and she's uh, late twenties. So definitely, uh, you know, much younger than I am. The variety of people who responded struck me. I am a young woman who is a Bruce fan, and I know Bruce is often thought of as the music of the, quote, older generation, meaning people in their 60s and 70s. I was struck by the range of ages, as you could often tell by the album or time period in which they described climbing in, which made me feel a part of something bigger, even as a young fan. It felt like I could see myself in some of the younger respondents and appreciate those of other ages. Um, so the the age diversity, the country diversity, uh, these things were just were just amazing to us. We were just we, we were just kind of overwhelmed both emotionally and with work um, when we got it. And, and I think my daughter really captured something in that um, as, as a young fan. 
I love that. Now, the historian in me must ask, what happened to all of these surveys? The, the raw material that didn't make it into the book, have you archived those? Have you kept those or were they destroyed after the publication of the book? Oh, we've, we've still got, we still have, um, I had, I will have to say, Antioch provided me with some wonderful uh, research assistants and I don't think I could have done any of this without them. And um, we definitely still have the data. Um, yeah. And I appreciate the the worrying about it because I'm going to start worrying about it now too. <laughs> well, we'll chat more about that offline later. Uh, <laughs> I think the IRB makes you keep it for a certain amount of time. I think you're okay. <laughs> um, what are some of the biggest takeaways from your book? Of course, we don't want to give them all away because we're going to be sharing a code for everybody to purchase the book later if they'd like. But <laughs> what were some of your biggest takeaways? Um. So the word um, isomorphism comes to my mind and you'll see how I'm using this. The responses were a balance of fun, excitement and celebration. So Springsteen, as most of us could know is so important in those times, those wonderful times, the you know arm, arm raising times but also serious life-changing moments, the depth, um, the monumental things in life, uh, the difficulties of life. And for me, it was just like a Bruce concert because in a Bruce concert, one minute you're up and everything's great. And then the next minute it's the price you pay and you're, you know, <laughs> or, one minute you're here, next minute you're gone. Uh, you know, some sad, some song that's just going to take you right, right down, um, right down to the depths. And so, the the responses really had that in them, and the responses. So, so the isomorphism is the similarity between Bruce and the responses, um, and there's lots of storytelling that grabbed our attention. I wasn't expecting such storytelling and Bruce is such a storyteller. Um, he, he, he connects so well and tells, so, tells his own story but tells other people's stories. And so many of the women told stories. I mean, some of which, you know, could make you cry or laugh as you were reading them. And I certainly hope if people read the book they will also cry or laugh. Um, and some that just really stay with you, that very layered, very personal, very meaningful. And again, just like what Springsteen does. So it, it, it's, these are more formistic takeaways, not content I'm giving you right here. Um, uh, but that it's so, it's so mirrored what the experience of Springsteen is, the experience of, of, digging deep into what these women had said. Um, and, and honest, I should throw in the word honesty. Um, again, another Springsteen trait, you know, as many people says, he tells it like it is. And so many of the women were so honest, even if, even if they didn't like what Springsteen did, they told us, um, oh, we love Springsteen. I don't know why he did that. Um, gee, could he have skipped that album? Could he have skipped that remark, whatever? Um, so all of that, that it just fits within the Springsteen genre to me. Is that making sense? Yes, no, perfectly. Donna, do you want to chime yeah. in here? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Um, I just, yeah, I mean, I think I could do maybe, Rain, because you did such a beautiful description of kind of the, you know, that experience of reading it, which I, I completely agree with. Um, I think I could just like say a little bit about the kind of themes that we we found, although we won't give everything away. Um, <laughs> uh, that um, there was a lot, I think, when we looked at it, it was a lot about growing together, like growth. So it really was, fandom really was an important part of these women's life journeys and our, our life journey. Um, and so there was a kind of develop, developmental arc to that, um, which, we, which we talk about in the book. There was also a lot about relationships. And when we asked about relationships, but that we did sort of say, well, fandom is relational um, for women fans. So there's a lot about how they were introduced to fandom through family and friends or um, significant people in their lives, but also um, how fandom becomes part of their life and this relationship that they perceive they have with um, Bruce. Um, 
recognizing that it's not a real, you know, not a relationship that you would have with a person face to face, but it's still a really important relationship. And we dig into that in the middle part of the book where we talk about the way that Bruce is like a family member or a friend or is sometimes seen as like a guide or mentor in life and other times is like a, almost like a therapist in, in women's lives. So, you know, there was a lot of that. And, and I think one thing that really struck me, which again, back to Cavici's work, Trumps Like Us, there was a lot of discussion about identification, um, you know, that people identify with what Springsteen writes. And we found that as well, that, you know, more than sexual attraction, which is one of the stereotypes of women fans, that it was really about identifying with the characters and the perspectives and the views that he brings in his life and music. Um, and that was really important. Um, so, and we also, they had plenty to say too about his writing on women, which we can dig into if people uh, want to, but um, those were those are some of the key takeaways, I think. Hmm. So do you think being fans made this book easier or more difficult to write? <laughs> we're we, gonna disagree. <laughs> yeah, we, Don and I have talked about this more than once. <laughs> I think it made it um, easier. Um, because I cared so much about the topic and I resonated with the, the, the depth, the eloquence, and, and it was fun even, as I said, it was even fun reading the ones who disagreed with him or were disappointed mm -hmm. about something. And I often tell students um, who are trying to figure out what to do for their dissertation is pick something you actually care about because no matter what, at some point you will be so sick of this work you will want to just throw it all away. But at least if it's something that you care about, you won't throw it away so quickly. And um, I remember being two weeks before the end of my dissertation, and I, I thought it would be better if I chucked the whole thing and started a whole new dissertation, that that would be easier. So go, doing research can drive you crazy, but I think this has driven me less crazy than almost anything I've ever done. And that it's really, it's really helped me. I, I never once, two weeks before it was published, I did not say let's can it and start it all over again. Okay, great point. I was just telling my students that today about how at the end of any project, doesn't matter what it is, you're like, well, I never want to see this topic again. So I definitely, I relate to that. And what about you, Donna? Did you have a different perspective? So I, and I share a lot of that perspective about, you You know, being passionate about it really does help because it's a slog at times. Right. And I do think I wanted to chuck it a few times, Lorraine, but, um, you know, we didn't. Um, I, I also really enjoyed I felt, you know, it was great listening. You know, I appreciated being in dialogue. I felt like I was in dialogue with all these other women fans around the world that I didn't know them. But I was reading their stories and I was like identifying with them. And and I love that. Um, there's a lot in the book about people would love to sit down and have a, a beer with Bruce. I'd love to sit down and have a beer with most of the women who responded to our survey. Um, that would be great. Um, but I confess I got to that. I got, you know, sick of it. I was like fed up of talking, thinking, breathing Springsteen, right? I was like, and I remember saying to my family, I just want to go back to being a fan. I don't know why I started this. Like, I just want to go and be in the audience and not be like thinking about analyzing this and reading all this stuff about him. Um, but that passed. <laughs> so how did you settle on the book's title was that difficult no that was easy and I'm gonna I'm gonna take that one because I wanted to write something about women fans for a really long time and I always wanted that to be the title uh the Mary Climbs in bit um obviously anybody who doesn't know Springsteen's work this is a play on a classic line invitation at the end of um Thunder Road which is probably my favorite song in Lorraine's and, and it features heavily in the book um, beyond the title. Um, but, you know, it puts out the invitation so Mary climb in and you, you don't actually know if Mary climbs in or not. But I thought it was to be wonderful to say, OK, Mary did climb in. You know, what happens next? And, and I think, you know, as women fans, we're all kind of Mary climbing in. So I always wanted that title and I was delighted that we got to have it. Yeah, and I would add to that, one of the things that we really had in common was that we both loved Thunder Road so much. I mean, we just both loved that song so much. And, you know, picking your favorite Springsteen song is like picking yeah. the five iconic women. It's impossible in some ways, but we're, we're both pretty, we're both pretty wed to, to that song. So that was good. And then for me, the whole idea of journey is 
was really important. Um, one of my big um, heroes in psychology is Joseph Campbell, who writes about the journey of the hero. I mean, he's written all sorts of books. Some people may be aware of him. Um, I mean, he's not really a psychologist. He's, he's, he's an archetypalist. I don't know what he is. But um, people are on journeys, and we're all on a journey. And I think that's also one of the appeals of, of especially all that early Springsteen. You know, we're blown out of here to win. Uh, that people people on a journey and Bruce has always been on one. And I love the fact that um, we had that, that, that car imagery um, of Mary climbing in and, you know, going off on the journey. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't know whether she did or not, but. In our book, she did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to get ready to open this up to audience Q and A, but first let me just ask, the two of you, if there's anything else you want to add before I do that. Um, no, I think I just, the other thing is this is about, you know, women, right? I would just say that for me, one of the things that I loved about the book was the, the discussion that we had. We asked women what they thought about um, Springsteen's writing on women. And I loved all the answers to that. There's a whole chapter in the book of which kind of addresses that. And, um, I particularly noted like a lot of women talked about the evolution of his writing and how it, you know his writing about women now was very different from when he wrote in the beginning of his career and how that really matched you know the changes of the last four you know decades that he's kind of grown alongside them as they've changed um and his, the music has changed uh, to go with that and so I that was something that I really enjoyed hearing and thinking about and writing um in particular. And, and I would just say, I'm on a mission to change psychology. Um, <laughs> and I've now presented some of this work at three major conferences. And I really wish psychologists and other people in the mental health field would take fandom more seriously, what it means to people, what it means in their life, how it can so many people said, this got me through the death of my father. This got me through the worst breakup of my life. Um, and I wish more mental health people would think about using music in a, in a therapy session. Uh, and, and you don't have to be a music therapist to, to do that. I've used his work and some other people's works in groups I've done. And so I'm on a mission to, um, I know there's a few psychologists in the audience. I'm on a mission to change psychology and, and just make it um, more open to some of the things that are so important in people's lives. Um, so that's, I really got, I always knew how important it, it was to me and, and my friends, but I got how important it can be to so many people. That's what I guess I'm saying and, and, and would like to just communicate, but thank you. I love it. It's the power of music more broadly and, and Springsteen in particular. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before I move into audience Q&A, I apologize if this is clunky, but in the chat, I have dropped a link to a flyer that Donna and Lorraine have kindly provided. It'll give you a discount code if you're interested in purchasing their book. I am also going to just momentarily share the screen so you can see that. Um, it gives you the discount code. I'll leave that up there for a moment in case anybody wants to take a picture or anything, but I dropped the link in the chat. So if you look in the chat, click the link, it'll open in your browser and you can you know, look at that after we've concluded the program. Uh, if any of this tech is not working for you and you are not getting the flyer or seeing the discount code, just go ahead and shoot me an email, mzobro at monmouth.edu. I also put that in the chat and I will make sure you get your flyer, okay? <laughs> so let me stop the screen share and we can get to the audience Q&A. Let's see. All right. So remember we are recording, but you are welcome to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Or if you would like to type it in the chat, I would be happy to uh, answer that for you. So uh, do I see anybody? We're 
we've got a lot of people here. It's hard for me to see all of the little squares at once. So if you want to ask a question, go ahead and risk just starting. I see a Martha Cook. Martha, did you have a question? No. <laughs> okay, no worries. We want to put you up on the spot there. Uh, uh, Martha, Martha, where are you, Martha? Jennifer Newman has a hand raised. So, yeah. Jennifer wanted to ask a question. Yeah, I. it's not really a question, but uh, just a comment. Um, I read the book To and From Vegas, going to the shows in Vegas oh. last week. And thank you. One of the things that I really liked that, that you spoke of is how how often women's experiences were based more in connection as being human and not necessarily based in, in gender experiences. And, you know, that resonated with me in something that, that, that I enjoyed. And I just wanted to say thank you for engaging in the project. Um, thank you. Thank I, you, I would say one of the comments that one of the women made are we both talking at the same time i can't tell no um you can. was that springsteen transcended gender and that really resonated with me um and again there were lots of different ideas but uh jennifer in keeping with what you're saying uh yeah am i allowed to say something yes please <laughs> go ahead you have the yeah. floor Okay, I have to say, I have to give a call out to Jennifer Newman because I met her in Paris last year. And we've been <laughs> friends ever since. And the group that we met was so much fun because we were all independently there. And the woman that um, we also met was Lisa Lowe and she's from Denmark and she had a ticket for me. And we're in the concert, we finally made it in, we're in the pit, we're hanging out. And I see her texting her husband and telling him where the food is for the kids. And I told you, honey, it was in the freezer. Just take it out and warm it up. And I'm cracking up because I remember as a single parent, like borrowing money from my son's bank account so I can run, go to the show, come back, get my fix. And this just, I mean, I can't wait to read your book, but that moment was so funny to me because I really felt a camaraderie with her and we're from opposite ends of the planet. And it just made me laugh. And I had to share it with everyone in this room because it was just, you know, the common, the common denominators in our lives. They're so real. And going back to the psych psychological um, comment before from the author, it, it was like these stories of Springsteen, what he shares and what we connect to is such a raw human level. It's emotional. And how can it not be part of the psyche and psychology studies, you know, because it just really, um, it really, uh, <laughs> yeah, it just, it just is deep in our souls, I think. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for that wonderful. And I'm so glad that you two connected. That's wonderful. And I was just thinking, we talk about this a lot. And it, you know, people made lots of friends, right? I mean, I know people make friends at Springsteen concerts, but I think it's because I know in this my experience, it's like, oh, if they're a Springsteen fan, I'm gonna like them because I already know that there's something I feel like I already know some things about yeah. them, you know, um, on a deep, deep level. So yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Thank we have you. a comment here in the chat. I thought the song The Wish would have been featured more. I don't know if they meant in tonight's uh, talk or in the book uh, more broadly, but would anyone like to comment on that? Um, there were some people who talked about that. Uh, mm. There is so much we couldn't get into it. Um, and the I wish we could have done more, but I will say, and I owe this to Donna, when we chose our five iconic women, we chose Adele, Adele Springsteen. <laughs> we had some Adele's in the chat here. Yeah, we chose Adele. We chose may, the wish. May she rest, rest in peace. Yeah. Adele Springsteen, the wish. She was right there. Um, so I hope we have honored her in some yeah. way. And I, I, I think in the book, we, we don't talk much about the wish, which I, I adore. I adore that song. Um, but the... Um, people did talk a lot about his mother and there's a bit about that, like that's a bit about his mother, his relationship with his mother and the fact, you know, somebody said something like if he, who doesn't love a guy who brings his mom on stage, you know? Um, so there, there are some definitely references, not so much the song, but to that relationship. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Lori seems to have her hand up for a while. Yeah. Sure. You should be able to unmute. Uh-oh. Well, well, we'll give her a second to find the unmute. In the meantime, here's a question from the chat. Uh, do you, Lorraine and Ornaga, think that the approach to Bruce has changed as he has grown older? That the appro okay. approach? I think that per, I'm reading the question as it's written. Perhaps it's Bruce's approach to women in his music. Oh, yes. Yes. Lorraine, did you want to go first? Um, that's the evolution mm -hmm. that Donna talks about and that, um, some women were pretty, um, critical of him for using certain words or whatever. And other women, um, one of my favorite lines was bull hockey, um, in response to people who said he was, um, sexist. And a lot of them did talk about evolution. And I want to I want to use one of, to me, one of the most important lines in the world, um, because there were so many different views about this line. Show a little faith. There's magic in the night. You ain't a beauty, but hey, you're all right. And that's all right with me. And some women felt really empowered by that. I don't have to, you know, do up my hair and be gorgeous and all that. And other women felt like diminished. Um, and that's what we liked. It wasn't just people could, when we say people could be honest, it wasn't just everything Bruce does is amazing and wonderful. Um, so I think that song and people's responses to it says something about, um, I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of almost like a Rorschach. You don't know really what to, what it is. You could put a lot of different meaning on it. And that's what people did, but there was definitely a sense of, as he's gotten older, um, he's evolved, uh, away from some of the, the language or whatever. And also a sense of we're all sort of influenced by what's going on around us. And that was sort of the language of rock music, um, so. Yeah, I was thinking that Lorraine. A lot of people talked about, you know, the "Hey little girl" and and you know those those kind of lines. But she doesn't really write anymore, and people noticed that um, and said that they didn't like it. I mean, a lot of women said they didn't like it. Some people said they didn't bother them. You know, some people were like I don't care. But a lot of people did contextualize it with like, well, it was the kind of rock vocabulary, right? And and noted that as he's got older, the way that he's writing has has changed, and that he does that rarely now. And, you know, I think that's one of the things about an artist that's been around so long and keeps doing different things. Mm -hmm. And a number of women talked about that, that he's not going on tour just to do things from 30 or 40 years ago, that things change constantly with him, that there's a developmental trajectory. And a lot of women who said they felt they grew up with him like he that 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 was the companion idea. I think that was really helpful that he wasn't just redoing. I mean, of course, we all love it when he does some of the old songs. Let's let's admit that. But um, he's doing a lot of other things too. He's written a lot of other things. I think Lori Carter is ready to go now. If we can give her a turn. Oh no! No. Do you want to put your question in the chat, Laurie? We'd love to hear ah. it. <laughs> um, we have a comment in the chat from Jim, who happens to be at a loud Starbucks. But he says, lots of musicians have passionate devotees, the Grateful Dead, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, et cetera. But what you see when you read Robert Cole's work, Dan Cavici's work, and especially Donna and Lorraine's work is the deep sense of emotional and empathetic connection between artist and audience. Dylan makes people think the stones and dead have a visceral pull. Springsteen does both, but no one seems to have the sheer psychological depth that he does. I think there's a gender dimension to this, though it's complex. Lorraine or Donna, would you like to comment? I love that comment, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> I would agree. And I'm like, I'm not the psychologist. So I'm going to let Lorraine talk about that. But um, I, I, and I've tried to pick, you know, figure out in my own life what it is about that makes the, the connection different, but it does feel different. And I like a lot of music, um, but there seems to be that. And it does, 
although I, I don't feel quite the same about transcending gender that Lorraine does, but it does cut across gender. It does seem to go to something universal and deep um, for a lot of people. Um, so thank you. And, and just uh, one of my, I don't know who said it, but one of my favorite things is about just comparing Dylan and Springsteen was like, um, uh, Dylan is the like the scratchy house cat and Springsteen is the chocolate lab. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that. Yeah. Um, I'll just make a couple of comments and I know there's one or two super Bob Dylan fans in the audience. Um, <laughs> so I need to be careful, but, um, uh, some of this started for me years ago when a woman that I, a young woman that I think, um, called me up because of Dan Cavici, who was an undergraduate and she wrote this article about um, for an American studies course, Dan, if you're there, you could speak up um, about groups that had really intense fans. And I was the person she interviewed for You Know Who. And there was also for The Grateful Dead, Bob Dylan and Fish. And I have loved that article and I wish she could have um, turned it into, you know, had it, had it published because it was pretty amazing. Um, but I always remember thinking this is my own bias, even among all of those who, who have those, those supporters, um, and my, my students will tell me other groups that they, the Jonas Brothers, I don't know, who they, you know, they really follow. We don't even have to mention Swift, Swifties, but I think that the psychological depth for me, um, and I think that's what, what Jim Collin is getting at there, is, is it just seems to be different. Um, it seems to be on a different level, which is why I can go present him at psychology conferences. But uh, yeah. And it's not even better or worse, good or bad. It's, it's different. Here's that comment from Lori. Were you surprised with what women discussed about Bruce's sex appeal versus the influence of his lyrics and music in their lives? Did you expect more or less of that? I wasn't surprised. I'm going to jump in on that. But I wasn't surprised at all. I was, you know, but but I think that was one of the things that Lorraine and I talked about early on. I think that, and other people have written about this too. There's the, I mean, the stereotype of, of women fans as being just sort of, you know, in love with the pop star or kind of sexually attracted to them and wanting to be the girlfriend. And, um, and you know, we were like, that doesn't, I mean, he's, he's a fine looking man. But that wasn't the basis of, you know, what we felt was the bigger connection. And so we weren't surprised. We were like, yeah, this kind of matches what we were kind of thought would be true. But it was really nice to have this big survey of women and find it. I mean, it was there, of course, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, the thing that I think was said the most. Um, and I would just agree with everything Donna said. And I just want to mention Dan, Dan Cavici is here and has his mm -hmm. hand up. And there are just some amazing comments in the chat, such as um, people don't get it that you ain't a beauty line. We don't, Bruce doesn't sing that to us. We sing it to him. There's just so many great lines in there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but if we could get to Dan, that would be great. There is, there's a party happening in the chat. So if you can multitask, yeah. make sure you're looking at the chat also. Did you say you're looking for Dan to unmute? Yeah, he <laughs> had his hand up. Was, Go ahead, was... Dan. Sorry, there's so many boxes, everybody, that I'm trying to get to everybody in due course. Go ahead, Dan. And my box keeps moving. It's very disorienting. <laughs> yeah, that's I, weird. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say how delighted I am that you've... Uh, you've explored this topic and uh, and really done so in a way that highlights the voices of women fans. I mean, I've been waiting two decades for this to happen. So it's, it's, it's fantastic. So but my question uh, alters things a little bit. It moves away from the content of Springsteen's music to um, perhaps how women um, use it in their, in their daily lives, or at least your respondents and how they, you know, use it in, in their daily lives. Did you discover um, any, any, patterns about that you know is it is it all with friends and family alone in the car between chores work all that sort of stuff like what 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 emerged i mean all of all of the us and thank you thank you for, for being here and for for your inspiring work that set us really on this on this journey um i think 
all, all of the above, like people use it, but I think that it's this constant companion in their lives, right? And women's trans lives. And, and what the, the three ways that we really explore in the book that women use it is this kind of like, when they need a friend, right? They turn to Springsteen as the music as a friend, somebody they can have fun with or somebody who's there. And then there's this kind of mental guide. So they're actually looking to the music when they're thinking about what to do in their lives or, you know, looking for guidance about next steps. And then there's also this kind of therapeutic um, aspect. So going to Springsteen when you are, at, for some women at the really the lowest points in their lives and finding, um, not just comfort in the music but like some hope and some you know again identification or something that you know somebody else has been down this path and is showing me that you know that there's hope at the end of this um range you want to add i would add two things i don't think most people's houses would be as clean as they are if they didn't have bruce <laughs> because lots of people clean their house to bruce that's true um, in the chat lorraine i don't know if you saw it but somebody oh, was it yes yes <laughs> <laughs> okay and um and then the other word i want to say because it hasn't uh, i may have mentioned it earlier but there's also a church spiritual religious mm -hmm. um in the second yeah. survey a number of people had been to bruce on broadway um and it just brought them to a whole other level of spirituality a number of people as you might imagine said going to a concert is a religious experience and you know, described it a little more. So I would say from the mundane of cleaning your house to experiencing the spiritual meaning of the universe um, yeah. and everything in between like Donna was just describing, yeah. Um, I think Betsy's had her hand up for a while. Okay. Well, hello everybody. Um, this has been so great and I am so stoked to read this book. And my question is a little less about the book. For, for fun last year, I listened to every Bruce Studio album mm -hmm. from start to finish in a row, which was wow. actually very illuminating. And yeah. I recommend it highly. Yeah. And um, one of the things I realized is that for me, about nine or 10 of those albums, I would consider perfect albums. And a chunk of those perfect albums came come after the year 2000, um, which I talk to people about when, you know, they, you know, you know they, they talk about the 70s. And I'm like, have you listened to Western Stars? So my question for you both is just, are there any albums that you personally just as fans consider perfect albums and if so what are they if you're willing to say i know it is a tricky thing to ask i this is a great i mean i love that i love what you did <laughs> and i want to go and do that i think that'd be really interesting and illuminating um i can immediately think of two that i always say like when people ask me it's um darkness on the edge of town um and tunnel of love mm -hmm. Those would be the two that immediately, I think, are perfect. Um, we're going to spend the evening here, right? The whole evening. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're already at an hour, so you're being very generous with your time. <laughs> um, certainly darkness on the edge of town. Um, I can't <laughs> say enough about the rising. And how he saved us. Uh, I mean, I can almost get tearful anytime I think of it. Um, it, it the music and the love um, and the help and just a perfect how everything. And um, I'm really quite a fan of Letter to You. Yeah. Um, I, I just resonate a lot there's probably a couple songs I'd take off. <laughs> so it's probably not the perfect album, but I resonate of, you know, so that's sort of an older one, a middle one, a newer one. Um, it would be impossible to, yeah. But I'm, you know, okay. you've, you've got me thinking now. I'm like, and I was looking at the chat as well, Lauren. I agree with you. Letter to You would be up there with me for me as well. And, and somebody said Nebraska. And I was like, yes, of course, Nebraska. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, there's, there's, there's few, there's a few out there. Yeah. 
Let me get this question from the chat in, if I may, because I think it's a really interesting one. Mm -hmm. The Bruce concert experience has been very mm -hmm. safe and respectful for women fans, not the same with other bands. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, people did talk about the the concert experience as being really important. We have got some work in that in the book around that. Um, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, but again, there were some di different opinions. So a couple of people, we asked questions about, you know, kind of sexism and, you know, in, in his work. And they were like, not in his work, but you go to a show. So, you know, definitely there is different opinions even amongst that. But I think a lot of people found a lot of friends at concerts and shows and felt that this was a space where, you know, it was, it was a good, it was a good space. Lorraine, I don't know if you have anything to add. Well, I'm just going to say that uh, one of my big fields is group therapy. And so just the whole power of the group mm -hmm. and the power of the group at concerts was, and again, not that he's the only one who has this, um, but I think the power of the group is part of what feels um, safe and respectful towards, mm -hmm. towards women, because there's that, that strong bond and, and kind of a safety mm -hmm. in that. Um, yeah. I also think, and I know he doesn't do this these days, but what does it mean when somebody lets the fans um, relay him across, you know, carry him across? I mean, there's some kind of, I'll just use the word trust. I mean, people are moving him down, up and down. Um, that's that's pretty amazing. Uh, I, I still can't get over that. Um, the times I've I've been, especially if you've been close to that at all. Um, so I think that that's there's sort of that trust. I'm not going to assume everything is respectful and safe towards women. And there were certainly um, some songs that some women thought were sort of yucky um, mm -hmm. about women. Um, but uh, I think for the most part, that's that's absolutely true. Um, yeah, um, there's one in the chat that I wanted to mention. Uh, uh, it was the yeah, one about um, something about queer. Uh, uh, yes. Let me see does anybody can... see that? Um, Let me see if I can find it. Oh, yes. The one about that great, that piece, My Butch Lesbian Mother. Yeah, I've read that. Uh, we, like, we did do some comments about that in the book, I think. Because I think... Um, we had a couple people who spontaneously on their own said, um, talked about lesbians love Bruce. Mm -hmm. um, it just, we didn't do a big thing of getting everybody's gender identity and sexual orientation um, uh, noted in the survey, but there definitely were um, some women who, who brought up, uh, and Donna, she mentions the book that we're part of two. Yeah, yeah, no, the I was on that. Mother, the Butch we do, Mother. We do talk about there are there are some references to pieces of other you know women who have written some queer pieces of, yeah. around Bruce. And, yeah, and yeah. We I think this is a great. That. It's a great. You know, it's something that I think is really interesting, and I would love to explore more actually. Um, but we, we did say in our in our book, it's mostly when people self identified and told us stuff, um, and there was a section around that, but. but but I just love that line, lesbians love Bruce. <laughs> it's, it's just like, because so many people think of him as in that, you know, heterosexual male dominated world. Mm -hmm. um, so it gave like a different perspective. Here's another question from the chat. Um, one can see John Lennon's growth in his approach and depiction of women from his early songs to the later Lennon. Yoko can be one of the main reasons for his change or maturity. I wonder how Bruce's divorce and his relationship with Patty affected his writing as it relates to women. Would either of you like to comment on that? I mean, I mean, it may have done. I mean, people commented. I mean, I don't think the Tunnel of Love was a very, you know, was a, was a definite change in his writing around relationships. Um, for me, I thought. Um, People definitely made some comments about Patty, and obviously he's talked about that. You know, and we we referenced the Renegades podcast, and he's talked a lot about how he feels that 
the relationship with Patty changed him and changed the you know the way he looked at masculinity and the way he looked at relationships. And so we do have some you know commentary around that. Um, and I, you know, for me, myself, I would say yes. I think that there is there is that um, change, um, Lorraine. Well, I'm going to go back to his sister. Because mm -hmm. I think a big change came with the river. Yeah. And that doesn't mean that the yeah. other changes didn't also. And I think that that's a good analogy with um, Lenin and Yoko Ono. Mm -hmm. I, I appreciate that. But I think something big happened um, mm -hmm. when he wrote the river. Yeah. And, um, and they say that a lot of that was inspired by one of his sisters. And um, uh, more real, more into some of the, the 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 troubles the tragedies the the oppression that women feel it felt like something it's it felt like something really changed um in that and and i remember kind of i don't know if those were my words but i remember kind of noticing that that something something happened at that point um that that seemed very different um so i, I would throw that in there too um and you know one thing i want to Make sure we mention before we end, nobody can really see this, but I'm wearing my favorite little button. I never buy any Bruce paraphernalia. People give them to me. Can anyone see what this is? No, I can't, Lorena. <laughs> okay. So this is a little tiny button and it's Bruce and Clarence together. Um, kind of like, you know, from Born to Run. And I just want to I just want to give a nod to Clarence before we if we're going to start to end at some point. Um, and a number of women missed Clarence, and I'm in that category too. So and and the love for the E Street Band and especially for Clarence, I just uh, I just want I I've been like touching my little pin um, off and on, and I just had to um, I just had to mention that that um, and I, and I, I was happy to see that I was happy to see um to see that love oh so now I'm, now i'm showing it <laughs> <laughs> now we can see it <laughs> all right okay <laughs> well thank you so much lorraine and donna for sticking with us even though we went a little over time i think this was such a wide ranging and robust conversation. I appreciate you coming to talk about the new book and I appreciate everyone joining us. Again, Lorraine and Donna's book is Mary Climb In, The Journeys of Bruce Springsteen's Women Fans. We gave you the discount code there in the chat. If you have any problems accessing it, shoot me an email and I will help you. It's mzobro at mammoth.edu. I hope you will all join us next month it's April 18th at 7 p.m. when we'll be featuring author Jim Cullen, who's the author of, amongst many other things, uh -huh. Bruce, uh -huh. Boys, Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel, and the Metropolitan Sound of the American Century, and a newly revised edition of Born in the USA, Bruce Springsteen in American Life. So, um, Lorraine or Donna, any last words from you before I end the Zoom? I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming. This has been wonderful. And thank you, uh, Melissa and the Springsteen Archives for hosting this wonderful series. And it's been great and just thrilled to see everybody's interest in, in, in this work. And it's been a great conversation. So thank you. Um, and, and I just, the chat is filled with so many incredible yeah. things. And I just want to call out to whoever said spare parts. Um, <laughs> great. And um, can we give our list of the iconic women? Oh, yeah, the big reveal now. Yeah, the big reveal. Should we? I don't know. I think uh, you should. But right. but definitely go to Asbury Park Press and read it too. Um, uh, with Chris Jordan, um, Mary, and we had a couple of different Marys because Mary is so important. Uh, his mother, Adele, Janie, and there's a couple of different Janies. Wendy and an unnamed woman in point blank. It was kind of a representative of a lot of really unnamed women in Springsteen songs who actually have yeah. a lot of power for yeah. listeners. And I noticed several people put theirs in the in the chat. Um, oh, yeah. and shout out to Sean. Oh, thank, thank you, Sean. Like in the <laughs> chat, you're a quick Googler. Thank you so much, Sean. <laughs> All right, well, 
I think that's it. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And we hope to see you at future events. Again, springsteenarchives.org or find us on social media to keep on top of our latest happenings. Thanks so much. Good night, everybody. Thank you.